Hi, Gary Allen here, welcoming you to the continuation of our project. Today, we complete the front yard as well as the back. We want to get you involved in this designer's landscape. We thought we would take a moment and reflect on what we've done so far to the front yard in particular. Last time when we arrived we had really some overcrowded growth. Plants that are really too big for their place up near the entrance so we wanted to open things up if you will. Well also we included some new beds and some new layouts close to the driveway. We drew bed lines that continued all the way to the curve and those are prepped and cleaned out and ready to go. Also behind me here, we had grass going around the trees and a little bit of a confusing pattern, so we simplified things. As you see, the smooth radius separating the two properties, if you will, and then also capitalizing on these existing trees, grouping a common bed between the two houses that continues all the way to the curb and touches the street as well. Now, we opened up the entry. We transplanted the Ilex shilling. They were all over in one mass and we've separated them to achieve some left and right balance. Also, we relocated or transplanted uh, some of the holly fern, the Laura Petalum, the African iris, and some other plants. In other words, making use of these transplants around the property. What do you say, while we're waiting for plants to arrive, we go in the back and see how our retaining wall has come together. <laughs> We're talking with Mike Costello of Paver Systems. Mike, tell us about the wall today. This is the new Anchor Highland Stone. It's a segmental retaining wall. It's a light tan and a light gray blend. Uh, it gives you a more natural stone looking wall. Now, when you say a blend, that means if you put it with gray, it kind of shows up as gray, or you put it with tan, in this case, it appears more tannish? Absolutely, yeah. and it, it works good with uh, if there's concrete around or you know a brick wall that has some tan in it. That's a neat feature. Go through the construction process for us, if you will. Well, the first thing you do is you put in a six inch gravel base underneath your first course, and your first course will be the 18 inch stone. And that first course is the most important course because it has to be perfectly level, front to back, mm -hmm. side to side. Uh, they'll be using levels and stuff like that to hammer them and make sure they're level. Uh, the stones are, have an automatic setback on them. There's a rear lip connector, which gives it a one, in, one and a quarter inch setback in okay. every row. So it, the, the wall sets back slowly. And they lock into place so they won't push forward. So they can't come forward. And yeah. it's a friction connection. I see where that, uh, that first course there is really the critical. Yes, absolutely. And then it kind of comes up pretty quick from there. After you get the, the first course down, it's just a matter of stacking materials on top of each other. Now, Mike, you, you said the 18-inch stone goes on the bottom for a foundation base. How do you know then how to build it with three different types of stones? Well, the thing you want to try to avoid is stacking your joints on top of each other. It, it also, I, I find it gives uh, the character to a wall instead of it being so symmetrically placed like many of the segmental walls are. Uh, right. What a nice variety. Huh? Yeah, and, and a neat thing, if you ever have a chance to see this stuff made, most retaining walls are made with a single split blade, one on top, one on bottom. This machine that makes this stuff has 22 different blades on top, 22 different blades on bottom, so you'll never get the same exact split twice in a row. And then the cap really decorates the top and uh, finishes it off, huh? Yeah, it gives you a good smooth finish on the top, and uh, they will glue that down in case there's children that come by and step on it. They mm -hmm. won't fall off and nobody will get hurt. Gotcha. So really, it secures everything from top to bottom. Yeah. Oh, very good. Well, we hope, too, that as we uh, backfill, we'll use some filter cloth in here and uh, really the landscape should make this wall look better. Yeah, I the landscape so. will make it look fantastic. With the, if you put trees, shrubs, whatever you like up there, or sod right up to the back side of it. Great. Mike, we appreciate all your help today. I mean, the uh, project looks better. Thank you. Well, we've been working hard lately, so what do you say we have some fun now talking about some of the plant varieties? It's neat, when a truck pulls up, uh, we're all peeking our heads in the door to see how things look and it was kind of neat unloading the uh, the daylilies and uh, it's a surprise N nice to know that they're flowering or blooming we have a couple generic different plant types happy days azaleas the fashion azalea boxwood in one gallon and threes and even these beautiful newly flushed 
three gallon sago palms. Now we've ordered a few extras for some other projects and, and we want to do that. Also our goal is to have a truck driver come in, kind of unload him and get him on his way because he has a couple more drops to make. But I've really unloaded things here that we can spend some time talking about. Number one is the Laura Lee Pit, a beautiful variegated speckled leaf dwarf compacted pit. A couple two to three feet overall height so we'll use these effectively where we need a little bit of variegation in color. Also moving back to the beautiful partially flowered still red ruffle azaleas. We can depend on these to be uh, colorful. Another two to three foot overall height of plant that we can use in the part sun and semi shade areas that we seem to have plenty of here. And while they're green during the rest of the year, this beautiful red colored flower with the ruffled edge, hence the name red ruffle azaleas. Look forward to using that. But let's slow down and talk more intensely about our daylilies. Maybe we could share some information from the grower on the Marsha Fay Daylily. It's neat because on these tags, a grower would help you as a viewer or contractor, homeowner, uh, to know the most about this plant type and what it really takes for it to thrive. So as a suggestion here, they say select a sunny site to a partially shaded place that's well drained. See, that's important. Then it says that you could use peat or compost or well rotted manure about a 12 uh, inch depth you know, if you're planting or amending the soil there. But here's some, here's some key parts. Mentioning uh, about an 18-inch spacing, but to set in a hole at the same level as grown. We, we talk about this all the time, and that is not planting this or any other plant too deep, including trees. Keep that as the existing soil that it comes in the container from the nursery. And then it mentions about mulching and fertilizing, but don't heap up the mulch around the plant with time. So again, some good, good tips or points for us to use. We look forward to utilizing the color here, really splashing it in maybe right here by the entrance and see how these work. We'll use the Marsha K Daylilies to accent the front entrance. And uh, what I want to do is start somewhere in here with the double or triple row. Let's see how that works out, we'll jump over the walk again. Remember, this is what we've created, this little linking. And so we'll have that daylily line run underneath here and end in somewhat of a, a big question mark, if you will, to accent this part of the entrance and give us that little bit of depth. Let's set those up. We'll show you what they look like. I think a double row is going to do the job here. I've really grabbed the ones that are blooming. We'll primarily use them first initially to set up our impact. That's going to work. Now, up under the entrance, the front door. Join me there. There is one thing as I head toward the front door, taking note of these really nicely decorated planter boxes. A square here and one on this other side of the walk. I want to try to incorporate my planting into them, but I don't want the squares to dictate the curves that I want to implement. And uh, kind of by showing you that, let's start with, uh, this is a, a compacted pit, Pittosporum Glen Special Compacta. So it doesn't get as large as the regular pits, but we'll use it as our largest plant here in the setting, a nice glossy green foliage. You see this corner, I want to take this row of pits which is nice and green and it's gonna look good against the backdrop here. And I'm gonna curve a radius and then use them as a gate to jump over the sidewalk and even install the first one or the last one in this planter. So my line begins here and heads in that direction. Let's set some of those up. Simplistic curves or circles always seem to work. Now with one in the planter box, I may even add another one here and maybe a third one to extend into the box. I don't want to cramp the walkway too much, but I do like the way this radius looks. Now we'll just come down with something lower here under the tree and also kind of intermediate or lower towards you. Now you should be able to notice some of the changes we've taken place here, a little African iris on the wall, but with the green pit, the compacta, I used Aztec grass behind me here in the shade, and it really takes on the same type hooking pattern. 
We've pulled it in across the walk. With this little splash of sun in here, a low procumbens juniper that's got a nice blue-green contrast to it. And again, it takes us down rather than having something a little bulky. You remember we set up one row of the red ruffle azalea? Well, here we've come in with, with a double just for more emphasis. And remember, we talked about how, uh, why should we let this square corner brick block planter uh, dictate our design? And really, we've started there with that double row and come around. I did the same thing with the fashion azalea on the other side of the house. We actually took the corner and rounded it, one plant in there and another that just peeled, the rest of them that peeled around and gave it kind of a curved feeling, if you will. Our existing hollies here and also We've come in with a dwarf lower petalum. Now, I know what you're thinking. We just transplanted a larger variety of lower petalum from the front, and that's true. Uh, but this is called Ruby, a nice, rich burgundy color, and it will stay lower or more compact in nature. So, really, it does splash and give us a color, a break of everything being kind of green when the azaleas aren't blooming and such. You notice some of the lights going in here. We need to catch up with our lighting contractor and really talk about how that's coming together. We'll speak with Guy Romano of Lightscapes. How you doing, Guy? Hey, good to see you nice today. Nice to see you, too. Uh, tell us, if you will, the, the plan for lighting this project. Well, in this particular project, uh, we confided with the homeowner, and he had some specifics on what he wanted lit. Uh, so what we did was we incorporated what he wanted right. with, with our ideas to give it more balance and depth. Okay. And in this situation, um, certain things, especially the key on the oak trees, mm -hmm. he wanted that highlighted sure. and the oak tree on this side of the home. But the, the prettiness of the home with the brick and everything, I, I felt that the pretty landscaping plus the brick would make it even highlighted even better. Okay, so you're actually bringing the house again as a backdrop as the back in, into play. That's correct. And then this way it'll, it'll all blend in and we're giving them lots of length and balance. So each section of the house, not only will the landscape jump at you, but the house will jump at you. Okay, good. So I'd say it's a good challenge. With all these canopies too, it's almost like you've got a lot of interesting... Uh, objects to play with. That's right. There's, but you can't light them all. No, because then it, would, it wouldn't look like a picture mm -hmm. is what we're trying to So create. what are you selecting even as far as a wall? How do you know? Uh, I guess too, in your mind's eye, you you see it. That's correct. Yeah, I see it already. The, yeah. Right. And yeah. it's, it's just a matter of putting it all together. And then after it's all set up and done, at night we come back and then that's when everybody gets to okay, see but the then, total picture. Let me ask you, how do you decide which tree gets it, which tree doesn't, which panel on the wall? It, it's you know? something that, it's, it's, it's a picture that I take in my mind. Okay. That really, I, you know, I've been doing it such a long time that I can see it before I even put the, the lights on it. I heard you talking earlier how important the entry was. Yeah, the entry, we wanted to give it a nice uh, soft look, not a bright look. So we're trying to eliminate that because of that glare. They call it, uh, you can blow something out if it's too hot. If, yeah, too it's too intense. high. It looked okay. too hot. So what we're doing is we're putting some ground lighting and some up, but a soft up, especially on the, that pretty Lagosha you put yeah, inside. Yeah, that, that is a feature there. Oh, yeah. So we have some points of interest in the backyard also. That's correct. So, Guy, how does our plan differ in the backyard here? Uh, number one, uh, the way it, it, the, the homeowner wanted another specific thing done in the back. And what we did was we balanced it off with the palms and these trees yeah. and the low lighting. But he wanted to be able to use just the low lighting when he wanted to, plus the up lighting when he wanted. So he wanted separate controls on both. Okay. What about the house or the structure then in the backyard? Well, uh, in, in all honesty, the backyard's for the homeowner. Uh, it, that's where you want to keep it, I call it romantic, serene, pretty for them. Uh, here we have a lake, so really there's nobody on the other side to be looking in. Okay. So, and you don't want it bright, you want it soft. Backyards, uh, again, it's for the for, Okay, for the so front yard entrance presentation, backyard, you're kind of looking from the inside out, so let's decorate so things. So decorate for uh, them, so they can see the whole thing. Okay, right. what about the timer or controller here? In this particular instance, we're using a timer that is controlled from inside the house. Inside? Inside, with no wires, no attachment. All they do is just plug it in the wall. Basically, it looks like an alarm clock. It works with the existing wires already in the house by sending a signal. And the different transformers that we have, we put what we call receivers in them. When they hear the signal comes in, click, the power goes on, the lights come on. 
And that's the only way you can get what, the, what you want, what the customer wants in this particular situation. So you can zone that? Front, back, sides, interior. You can also put modules inside. So you can have everything going on and off on a timer, and nobody knows if you're home or you're gone. Uh, Guy, you know, lightning can be troublesome in the south here. Uh, any precautions there we should think about? Well, with this particular timer we're putting in, in the closed position, it, if there is a lightning hit on these, on these fixtures, the wire, uh, the electricity that goes into the wire will stop right at the module in the closed position. I know the homeowners here uh, are going to appreciate the lighting and make good use of it for years to come. Oh, without a doubt, especially here with the water, with the copper and everything, it's, uh, they're going to have a very nice time with these lights and they're going to enjoy them very well. Very good. Thanks for being with us today. My pleasure. Now you might notice that's still a little dark in there, but a pressure washer will take care of that. Well, at the homeowner's request, when it came to the mulching, uh, we decided to use a pine bark because that's what they wanted. Now, rather than a large bark here, uh, we have what's called a mini nugget. So this is not a fine pine mulch, but again, uh, it's shredded into uh, kind of a, well, two inch size, two to three inch size. And so that doesn't float as much and we've got a nice thick layer of it on there behind me here. I plan on installing some annuals, some impatience. And if you notice, yes, we've mulched and we put our impatience in after we mulch rather than having the pine bark kind of tear them up. So we're going to work our way around the property and just show you how things are shaping up. I think the biggest change or uh, difference is that here of the front entrance. You remember when we began the overgrowth and the crowded feeling that we had here at the front sidewalk and entrance to the home. Now, we opened things up, we cleaned them out, we transplanted, relocated some of our materials, achieving balance with our Ilex shillings. And now, look what a difference. Again, lower plant types or varieties that give us a layered look all the way down here, a little bit of color, and some direction. We're moving left and right, if you will, connecting the whole picture. Looks better. Also, we could take notes of the improvements here. Uh, remember, we had the ginger that was planted in here kind of sporadically, and it looked a little unkept. And now uh, we've really added some formality to this, if you will, some direction with the fashion azaleas here. And we'll come in with some color, some impatience under the magnolia tree to give that semicircle or half circle boundary of color between the green transplanted holly fern and our newly planted azaleas here. Uh, the impatience, the choice of color, as you see, we'll be ready to install those soon. And you remember even reflecting on this, we tried to simplify things, the mowing pattern, uh, by rounding this off and making it easier. Even in the shade, I find that the Aztec grass, anything variegated, always seems to make a great impression. Oh, and don't forget the beds at the street. If you remember, our challenge was that with these two separating properties, how could we avoid putting a straight line divider between the two homes? And so our combination was taking the existing bed with the trees and combining it, this process all the way to the street, covering up, softening the cable box using shade plants in heavily shaded areas where shade dominates here. Now we have a full sun bed near the driveway. You'll find that we consistently have our beds come touch and attach the curb. Again, it gives us an inside little feel for a rounded radius rather than a corner and softens the concrete. Remember what things looked like here before. And then when I drew the lines, again, the game plan, opening things up and then planting with drought tolerant plant material like the lantana, the low juniper, and the dwarf pit, it helps soften the driveway. Now what do you say, let's go plant some annuals. As you see, the guys are fine tuning uh, the lighting system, getting everything set there. And so Dan has set the impatience up in here. And I mentioned mulching first. Uh, see, if we were to plant these delicate, tender uh, little things, um, mulching around here, dumping or heaping, it would really break them up. So we like to come in with our mulch first. and. Uh, Richie's really digging them by hand, but all we need is just a little hole scratched in there, and they'll sit right 
right in there, right underneath the mulch. I'll show you this guy here. A little tap pull out of the pop. As you see, there's really not much of a root system here. Now, I see some people take uh, what little bit of root system a plant has sometimes and tear it to shreds. I don't, I don't know that we need to do that here. Uh, we've got a little bit of uh, circulating of the roots, but nothing, nothing dangerously in trouble. So uh, we'll place them. We kind of pull our mulch and light soil around it, and then I just kind of press it in there. Okay. Now, uh, sometimes we do use a slow-release fertilizer. That is optional. And uh, I'm going to show you this other bed. Seeing as the spacing here is, is pretty simple or simplistic, we don't even need to set them up before we dig the little holes. Uh, oops, I see Dan beat me to it anyway. Uh, in other words, I think Dan and I have a, uh, enough of an eye, and you probably do too, where you could actually dig the holes on some plants before you set them in their place. And, and, uh, but with the guys we have working with us, we're always training somebody too, setting them in place ensures us, the designer, or a plant place person that uh, we get it right where we want it and right where we need it. We've got two rows going in here and what about the spacing on this? Do they have to be 12 inches apart? Well, not necessarily. Since these are smaller pots, we have the tendency to begin them a little closer than normal, but that's okay. They'll fill in and mass and pull out the color between these two green plants. thought it would only be fair to give you a little peek of what's been happening here as well. You know, we had the palms in place, and uh, I really think the African iris does a nice job of pulling together the, the kind of tropical feel there. If you look, too, the orange flags are going to be our fence. So we've put one palm outside the fence, and then the iris will come from inside to outside, too. We may have a plant or two in the way. We'll kind of see that or play that beer when the fence guys come. The holly trees that we talked about last time and um, how they were kind of in a bad way. We have put a nice slow release fertilizer on them and made sure now that they are irrigated and that should really help them. See the guys are working in their, in their mulch here and basically the fashion azalea, the Aztec grass and the low juniper. I even like the way the lower petalum gives that burgundy look on the wall. The retaining wall here, a lot of work. I think the homeowners are going to enjoy that for a long time. Oh, by the way, if you're interested in knowing more about materials that you've seen us use, plant varieties from daylilies to iris to some of the azaleas, you can always contact us on our website, www.garyallen.com. Uh, be patient with us. We're uh, trying to get all our emails answered. We appreciate your support continuity or being able to tie one part of the yard together with another is critical. It's important. And do you remember here, we had just a strip of grass along the driveway. We've come in and tied or repeated our turf grass in a semicircle fashion, connecting one part. Then the daylilies do the same thing, connect across the sidewalk, the Laura Petalum, the Ilex Shillings, the Red Ruffle Azalea, the Juniper, uh, the Pits and the Aztec grass, even the annuals, all the way to the front door. We've got this connection. It works. What do you say we go back now and you look at some before and afters on the entire project?
Hats off to the guys that work hard to bring you this episode. We'll see you on the next program. I'm Gary Allen. So long.